Welcome to BOF Live today. We're speaking to Gabriella Hurst, who has just been in Glasgow at the COP26 meeting. So that is the hot news ticket of the day around the world. Um, so Gabriella, what are your responses? What's your response as you, uh, as you arrive back home from Glasgow? I felt um, disappointed and hopeful, if it makes sense. I had both this, the two feelings. I've never been to a COPS before, which means um, committee of the parties. And I, it felt like a big car show, right? That was my, my, my first impression, like a big trade show uh, with all these different pavilions. But then as I started talking and meeting people and realized that everyone there was, you know, was wanting this change, at least the meet people I was meeting, I started to become hopeful. And I met one of my big take, two big takeaways are from me is we've done a lot of um, progress in arguably in voicing diversity and the need of diversity. But there's one diversity that's not happening, which is the pan-generational. And it's very clear. And I talked with people through different ages and I was in a panel with my friends, uh, Daniel Hum and Dustin Yaling. And afterwards there was this panel, which for me is the reason why I went to, to, to COP. Um, it, was, it was Dr. Sylvia Earle, uh, Joram Rockstom, which is a professor, which is like my, my, my hero. And Alexia Vitae, this um, Mexi Mexican um, Gixe Bastida, this Mexican um, uh, activist, 18 years old, she's in, in Philadelphia, and hear them speak, right? Dr. Sylvia Earle is 85, um, Bastida is 18, and hearing them speak, right? And hearing the thought process from the elderly to the young that have been seeing this problem. Um, that was very, very um, inspiring to me because obviously this is a problem that's been with us for, for, for over 50 years. We know what, what has happened. And what we didn't know that the biggest uh, subsidy for the global economy is the oceans. That's the thing that was miscalculated. Um, because the ocean have been let us live how we live because they've been absorbing the heat from all the greenhouse gases. And then my other takeaway was that how much responsibility is in the private sector, right? And if we talk about it in numbers, the McKenzie report says we need an annual investment of $3.5 trillion in the new economy for the next three decades. $3.5 trillion annually for the next three decades. And the bill that just passed in the US for the next 10 years of infrastructure is $1 trillion. And perhaps, I'm not sure of the actual number, is $300 billion towards um, the new sustainable energy um, and the new economy. So you see the disparity between these two budgets. One is like the number one or number two global economy, depending how you're seeing it, having one trillion for the next 10 years and the private sector has to invest 3.5 trillion. So for me, it's like, okay, so we went through the industrialization process because of the private sector. So the private sector is responsible to take us into the new industrial revolution, to take us from the old, uh, industrialization process. And so, are, are those the numbers they're quoting to get to net zero then? To, to get to a place where we, we survive as a species, basically, we, we will, um, this is a, a big issue I have when people say, let's save the planet. I always feel like, okay, this is like the issue with our species. We're not saving the planet. We have to save ourselves because we're going to go extinct and the planet is going to go just fine without us. Yes, exactly. As it's been before us. We are kind of new and we became the top predators in no time. And if Dr. Sylvia Earle would be here, she would be, and I hear her voice in my head going, because every time the conversation became too human, she started speaking for, 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 for the animals, for the oceans. She started thinking for, she started 
speaking for 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 the whales she started speaking for all the species we think we we this idea of um of separation which for me exception exceptionalism that's what it is yeah. exactly yes that's yeah. a correct word um and for me because of the way i grew up with my mom and in a ranch my my narrow pathways because we were very few humans living in this large now natural um, landscape that you, you're probably very familiar from New Zealand. Um, it, we know how how powerful nature is, and if there's ever a conflict between nature and man, well, man is not winning. Okay, it's not going to win. So we need to find that balance, and and I think that the hopeful part is that we're moving forward, right? I think we're moving. The big question, the big if is are we moving fast enough? Um, because, I mean, I don't want to bore you, but I'll put it in a broad stroke. Right now we have a dependency of 80% of fossil fuels, right? Of our energy source. And then we have renewables, right? For our new economy. But right now the renewables are not able to transition us to this part. So we need these middle term energies which for me, in my opinion, are hydrogen, safe nuclear, and fusion. These are the ones that are going to be able to transport us because fusion can give us a lot of energy with uh, very little waste and, and continue. So, you know, I have a lot of thoughts about this, so I don't want to... What, what, what is the application of that in the fashion industry? Because I noticed that there was a lot of talk at COP about our fashion's role in the scenario and it 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 kind of threw us up against some really really key issues with fashion um how does the fashion industry uh, obviously there are there are certain ways like you're talking about um uh energy sourcing and so on which can which which can definitely impact on on um the production uh, process the, the 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 supply chain in fashion, but uh, an, an an issue that I was really interested in that that was raised as being actually maybe a problem that is the most challenging is the notion of consumption. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting because I I do a diagram and I actually have it that that um, I draw it every time, but I'll do it. It's imagine a circle, right? Because what I see, what our biggest issue is, and, and by the way, we've been told that we're like the second polluter. Um, that has not been proven or disproven. So we cannot use that as a fact. You know, sometimes we have these facts that are thrown and we don't really check. But if you ask, that hasn't been proven um, if we are, the, we are the second biggest polluter. But what I do think, we do have a contribution that we have to be responsible for sure and I'm not taking out the, our responsibility out of the question, but I, the issue I see is the issue that it's similar to other industries where we have fossil fuels, right? Our dependency, then it's connected to um, overproduction. We overproduce and that pushes an overconsumption and that produces waste, right? So when I, so the, you have that circle and then on this part, here we have the conservation part, which is very essential for, for our future and our presence. Because, you know, we talk in the future, but we forget to talk. And I'm going to diverse for one second because it's important to bring this to the conversation. That between the tropics, people have been suffering the, the effects of climate change for decades. People have a very difficult time surviving and the number of refugees that right now from climate are growing. So we talk in the future, but right now people are living hell on earth. So I just wanna make us aware that those people, when we're talk, having this conversation, they're paying the price of how we lived in the development world. Africa is responsible for only 3% of the emissions. That's nothing. So going back to the conversation, then you have here fossil fuels, if you have fossil fuels, overproduction pushes overconsumption, which is waste management, and then conservation. Rehabilitation and conservation, and this is the good news. If we leave our planet 
the ability to heal, right? If we leave the planet, the ability to heal and restore itself, it does miracles, just as our organisms do, because we are part of the same. And so fossil fuels, overproduction, overconsumption, waste management, and conservation. I calculated roughly how much money, I mean, I, this is an, an, a question for you. How much money do you think the industry spends on fashion shows per, per, per season? Uh, in the old days or now? It may be in the old days, and I, I could tell in a, you In a full people. fashion week, in a full fashion week, um, yeah, and there are how many the shows in a full fashion week? Yeah. A hundred, uh, maybe less. hundred million? hundred million? Uh, yeah, I think that's probably low-balling, but... Um, I was thinking 200 million. I think from probably, my roughly. yeah. Yeah. And then multiply that by two, but be conservative. We're talking a half a billion dollars. Can you imagine how much land could we buy and preserve? Okay, that, then the question is, um, if you're, we, 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 we're, we're still in the pandemic, but, but we're now kind of quite a long way through the, the uh, reevaluating thinking mm -hmm. about, what, about what fashion should or could do and fashion shows were a big part of that like the are they important what do they mean can people find alternate ways to promote their yeah. promote their work um i saw alternatives i saw very very viable alternatives i i think that there are still designers who are working with that but then we just in paris it felt like the old ways had returned, you know, to to a to a to an extent. I mean, some designers embraced the opportunity to show their clothes in a different way. Others did what they'd always done. I mean, you had a fashion show at Chloe. I wondered how you felt that fitted into this new model for how fashion needs to. Now, I'm, I'm happy you're asking me this question because. You know, I was part of those conversations too. And I, and I think the conclusion was that as creatives, as any creatives, we like to have a live experience and share our creation with other humans, right? To have that. The, the issue is like, does it have to be that big, right? At Gavilla Hearst, I've always had to justify the budget because we're a smaller company. Why do we do, I have to always justify budget wise, why do we do a show? because it, it's a lot of our budget towards communications. And so we noticed that there was this peak of attention is where we create our most of our context. Our shows have always been small by definition and I like a small show. At Chloe, with a bigger platform, right? We did a small show of less than 250 people. It was the smaller show that Chloe had done. And we'd use different non-for-profits to celebrate right? Others came to the table. If we're going to spend this amount of money to, to a show, let's make sure that it's not just a self-promoting exercise either, right? There are other workmen are there that the community and our belief system is here too. So we're not just elevating ourselves, but we're elevating the works of others. And that's kind of the same principle that we did at Gavilla Hearst, but here the platform is bigger, so you have more responsibility. So now that's you, how we approach it. Yeah, you used a number of NGOs to contribute to the Chloe show. How, how did that pan out? I mean, you, you, you want to generate, um, you want to generate awareness of their work. How did you feel that worked afterwards? Did you feel there was a sufficient sort of understanding of what it was? I mean, even in something like the bricks that we were sitting on, yeah. that was a whole really interesting story, but do you feel that, um, that there was there was interest generated in, in that, that people understood it and appreciated it and saw that this was, oh, it was a fashion show, but also there was a, re a really solid subtext there of, of, you know, social awareness. Well, definitely, I think that that happened. Um, you could feel it. Um, and I can also quantify it. I mean, when we did our first show for, for Chloe, even if it wasn't live, um, I had met Bas Trimmer from Shelter Suit, which uh, arguably has the altruistic version of the most altruistic version of, of, of my profession, right? 
He's a fashion designer that has used all his ability to create the shelter suit, which is these, these amazing sleep bag jackets that are entirely made not for profit for people experiencing homelessness. And so he's, he is a, a social entrepreneur, right? A designer, and he creates them out of dead stock material made by Syrians refugees and they're non for profit. And he uh, basically in my launch collection at Chloe, he had three looks, right? Because I mean, I'm not gonna tell you, it's not new news, a new designer in a fashion house, right? So the little spotlight that you get for two seconds you want to maximize it and share with someone. So we share it with Bass and he has had tremendous exposure, especially when he's trying to, to start his, um, his, his starting already, his shelter suit in the US, when, which is really a huge issue. Um, the, the, the effects of, um, of uh, being homeless in, in key cities. I mean, things he saw here are, 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 in, are just not things that you've seen in Syrian refugee camps. I mean, it's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So he got a bigger profile, he got more attention, he got out of fashion company calling. So it, so it helped, so it can be quantifiable. How do you see, do, did you see that as the first step, that show? Did you, did you see it as something you will expand on subsequently? I, I mean, there were the shelter suits, there were the, the bricks that we sat on, there were also the shells, there were uh, there the shells, there was the crochet, there was, there was a, you know, artisanship has been something that fashion's been talking about for a while. And I think there are, there are a few designers who really creatively use NGOs around the world to, to contribute to that. How do you see that expanding um, with a platform like Chloe? I've always find it uh, intrinsical and also it's part of, of, the, of the moving forward of a concept that, that, you know, we always have like social impact and environmental care kind of separated as the two parts, but it's actually, it's actually goes together. It's all, this is where, you know, talking to artists really helped me because it's more about blurring the lines you know that you're helping the environment by helping other humans. So it's, 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 it's really bringing it together. And, and for me, Chloe Care, I call this, it's, it's something that really, it, it, it gives me purpose, right? It's, it's a very difficult time to just justify what we're doing. So if you don't do it with a, with a purpose that is honest and really moving you forward, it's hard. <laughs> But getting back to getting back to the idea of consumption, though, um, I, 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 something you've always done is it, it, I think it's something that struck me the first time I met you is um, the re the repurposing. Um, I guess it's upcycling um, yeah. of 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 old fibers and and so on, it, making something, creating a new preciousness. Uh, it's, it seems to me that the idea of consumption could be approached if you could be reevaluated, if you can re-educate people in the notion of in the notion of value, and and also the, the the sense of what is precious, the sense that everything you buy has been contributed to by a lot of different people, which which is something you really emphasise that the supply chain isn't the usual supply chain. It involves a lot of very creative and very human input. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you re? How do you make people reassess value and reassess preciousness? I mean, it's something I feel that haute couture has always had at its core, um, which makes it oddly sustainable in a way. But how do you do that in ready to wear? Well, you know, it's interesting, and this is what was one of the. I've always had the, I've learned about quality and sustainability from a utilitarian point of view of growing up in the farm because things have to be made well, right, in order to last. Like right now, my desk at, at the office, it used to be my old dining chair from dining table from, from 15 years ago. We don't throw a can of paint because we can reuse it to, to water the horse. I remember when I inherited my father's ranch which was what determined to create Gavilla Hearst. I remember telling my foreman because you know the water like you have these water tanks and you get like a little bit like 
ticky, 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 ticky of water, of hot water. Like I literally in the winter, like would shower every three days. Sorry, but it's true because it's so cold. And so I told him, do you think, because I've been living in New York for a while, do we change the water tank? And you know his answer, and I'm his boss, okay? You know what his answer was? And naturally, let me think where I can put that water tank somewhere else. It's not like we're throwing away the water tank. Before I, you know, make you feel more comfortable with your hot shower, let me figure out what we can do that. So that mentality of repurposing and using and fixing is very, very inherited to, to, to how I grew up and, and, and how I um, create too. And so when we did our, it, it just feels natural to me. And I think that when, to think that in 2017, we did our repurpose uh, uh, pieces at the show. Um, and now this became a common practice, but this is not a new concept. It's an old concept of just appreciating things. And um, when it comes to fashion, I always say, let's not look into the future. Let's look into the past and learn from our history. So I've been very keen in learning older techniques uh, from botanical dyeing to weaving to just, let's go back to when things were really precious. And Gabi Agnon, the founder of Chloe, created Chloe for exactly the same reason I created Gabriela Hurst, but you know, over a century, over half a century later, because there was a need of something of quality and of, um, of integrity. And I really thought hard for two years for the launch of, of Gorilla Hearst because I was in the contemporary Shmata world for a while. And then I inherited, uh, and no, no hate on that because I learned everything about supply chain and delivering on freaking time because of my years in the Shmata business. So I come from you know 38th and 9th Avenue, <laughs> not, a, not a French Maison and it's with pride. I say that because I've learned the system in that way and I learned what's wrong on the system, uh, overproducing and overconsumption, by the way. And, and so she created because there was a niche in the market. And that's the same reason Gabriela Hearst was formed because I kept on saying, if I'm going to put a new brand out there that's going to be about integrity, about tailoring, which is something I really wanted to do with two values of long-term beyond sustainability, the product we have to put there, it has to be superior to anything else. And so in quality and longevity. And so that's really the DNA of, of, two, of the two brands. It's not, it's not far, but obviously being in Europe and, and working more and because in Gavilla Hearst, I, I don't overproduce it's, it's, and then I started to realize this pyramid, right? In my head, where it talks about the environment really that each luxury brand, each big luxury brand has these volume drivers, right? Because the, this word volume driver. And so the volume drivers, I created a pyramid where Chloe Craft goes on the top. And then in the middle, it's like the, the industrial hand with the, 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 the human hand. Chloe Craft is entirely made by hand. So when that has a symbol, it's coming out in, in, in summer, it's a product that is entirely made by the human hand. And then you have the middle and then you have the volume drivers. And so the volume drivers is the one that we target really, really fast to try and change from the impact of uh, water and, and greenhouse emissions. Because if you change what you do a lot of, you're going to see an impact. That's my theory and our theory. And that's what we're trying to measure. So we did the Nama sneaker. We did the circular denim. We're redoing the, the woody tote. And then we send them to the life cycle analysis because just because I tell you it's sustainable, you don't have to believe me. You have to have a third party be accounted for us. This is why it's so great that Chloe is a B Corp now. And I think what, Chloe, I thought what I liked, I loved about Chloe Craft and the show is that it, there's a humility to it. It's actually quite humble. I mean, it's patchwork and, and crochet and, and it's, and you know, I think of I think of my my kind of my kind of classic Gabriella Hearst item as a poncho yeah. because it connects with your upbringing. But to make an item which is so utilitarian and so humble into something that becomes like the last word in luxury is kind of what I'm talking about: the redefinition of precious. And that because you do not dispose of a poncho at the end of a season and pick up on whatever's coming next. You have that poncho forever. 
So that would seem to address consumption in one way, but how does fashion deal with something that people don't want, that people want to wear forever? How do you, how do you, how do you reconcile desirability with, uh, I mean, with desire is obviously a big part of consumption, yeah. but how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you reconcile desirability with durability? You know, make, make, sustain the desirability of something but also kick off desire and other things that people are going to want. I mean, which is fashion after all. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts with that. Thank you. It's the, the I've always thought of this ability as, as a tool, right? Because I was never fooled with the idea that people would buy us for our good intentions. And so you, you bring this ability, you attract. I mean, beauty has always been there for the human spirit to, to, to inspire and elevate us. So the, this ability is the tool to attract. And then I do think that we're always together is in this, in this industrialization that happened in fashion. But how can we be surprised that if it happened in food, why wasn't it gonna happen in fashion? It happened in other industries. Um, and so, but I have an, an anecdote that just happened to me last week um, where um, I went to an event at Pioneer Works and anyone that is in New York should go to Pioneer Works because they mix arts and science. And there was these kids, right? And one of them has like a t-shirt that said, see you in the metaverse. And I was like, you're not seeing me in the metaverse. And she's like, no, but let's talk about this. Why won't you see you in the metaverse? I'm like, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do things that feel good in the physical world, like that craft. And then he started explaining me, but you know what that the metaverse is going to do? It's going to make craft more important. We can send all the industrialization things maybe to the metaverse. That's what he was trying to explain. I'm still not sold on the metaverse, but the actual craft things is going to be more important. So in a way, craft, which is the past, because there's every culture in the world has craft. Mine is a gaucho. And to make a poncho takes two years, two years to make a poncho, right? But it's for the rest of your life. So for me, craft is the future. It, it is the future. And the woman that I see, which is in the future, and like maybe like this, this minimalized chieftain queen that wears this craft, it's, it's really, she's like, you know, a century away. And who, who is she? Is she, like a, is she like an Amazon? Is she like Bodicea? Is she like a, a warrior, kind of a warrior goddess? Is she's this, all is, of that. She's all of that. She's all of that. And she's also, I think what now I see them now, it's it's um it's like they're like spiritual guides, these women. And where do you see them? In in my subconscious, in you know, when opinion. I drift away, <laughs> when I go to sleep. I mean that, so they're your kind they're kind of your great grandchildren then, aren't they? I, I, oh my god. I mean, you took me to a level that I've never been there, but I I, I hope so, but my kids are already telling me because of climate change, they're not going to have kids. My daughter was like, you know, that wants to be a human rights lawyer. She's 13. She said to me, mom, I don't think you're going to have grandchildren, at least for me. I may pay for our kids to have an education, but you may not have a biological kid, but maybe I have non-biological grandchildren. So. How, how, do you, how do you feel when, when your kids tell you things like that? Because this is what I'm hearing from a lot of my friends. A lot of my friends who have kids who wish... They hadn't had kids. And then there's this whole other thing that's happening because of COP, which is the sort of fatalism of, of some of the thinking actually, actually curbs action. You know, it kind of, if, if people get into fatalist thought, then they're thinking, well, why, why do we need to do anything if we're at this point where, you know, where things are so bad and, and the problems are so vast and perhaps insoluble. What, what on earth do you tell people who say, I'm not gonna have kids? Um, we, we've always sort of kids as, as the ultimate hope for the future, obviously. I, I, you just nail it, like you just, you just hit in the head. I, 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 first of all, you feel like shit, right? But you know where she's coming from, but we've been so good at imagining the catastrophe right we're so good at like imagining the end the armageddon but 
that's why I repeat myself, climate success, climate success. This is why I, I think it's important to visualize that there's a future and there is some great people, very, very impressive minds working into these impossible, nearly looking impossible, but possible future. So I think that we are in a pivotal moment for a human evolution where we can go extinct or we can become better. That's basically, and, and, I, and I want us to evolve. And, I, and I, when I look at our brains and we have three brains and um, any neurologist with that can co correct me if I'm wrong, but we have the reptile brain, which is our oldest brain. Mm -hmm. We have the limbic system that we, that the reptile brain we share with all animals. The limbic system is, it's our mammal brain. And then we have the neocortex, which is our newer brain. So I do believe that, that there is something about us humans that is going to be able to do that bridge and that evolution. And, and I'm hopeful and I, and I want to really visualize and this is, but it's, don't get me wrong. there's days that it's completely overwhelming when, when I read, um, I follow obviously the climate news very closely, uh, but but this is why I spend my birthday away from my kids this year and, and being a Latin woman, I'm like, I, I just wanted them to know that I was, I was, I was trying to, to, to speak for them, you know, they cannot vote. You know, so yeah. I have to go do the work for them. I mean, you, part you, of my culture. you, you said it. The, the, you no, know, I swung around there because I was being plunged into darkness. It's it's getting dark mm. here. Um, just in case you wondered why I was moving around in the chair. Um, the you you spoke at the beginning about the importance of tra transgenerational activism. I have always thought that. I have always thought the conversation of grandparents and grandchildren. Yeah. Is in so many ways, it, it, it shapes so many things in our lives that we're not really even aware of um, culturally. But I think there's a freedom in, in, the, in the way that older people think, um, especially women, because as they get older there, they, they shed a lot of the, the preconceptions that society unladles on them. And then with kids, obviously, you have just the open minds and not shaped yet. And so the two of them in, in dialogue um, suggest, well, they, they are cause for optimism. I really, I really do yeah. believe that. Everybody in the middle, the people who are actually making the decisions and who are actually steering the ship in the wrong direction or trying to steer it in the right direction are the ones that you need to address. How do you feel your message connects with them? I feel like I'm in the, in the I'm literally in the middle, right? I'm, I just turned 45, so I'm literally in the middle. I, I do feel that the world is, is not ours anymore, that we have to elevate their voices. I think youth in the boardrooms was, was kind of like the message that I got from, from, from elders too, from, 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 from a big businessmen that were like, we need more youth on the boardrooms. We need to, to, to have this discussion. Yeah. And, I, and I've experienced it like in a social environment. Every time I do a good party at my house, it's because you have kids from 23 to like 75 kids I said kids <laughs> from 23 to 75 because that mentality that dynamism this 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 idea of, of um, exchanging ideas and and I really really recommend every anyone that can go um, see that that it's on YouTube the um, uh, Sylvia Earle and jo John uh, and Bastida and, and Jock Rockstorm conversation to go look at it because you see the benefits of, of the pan-generational uh, conversation. It's really interesting. And, and for me, we have to preserve what we have for them, for, 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 for my children and everyone's children. I mean, I, I come from a culture and when Bastida talked about this, I got very emotional because she's Mexican and I'm Latin and we come from that, that, that culture that you need to leave your kids better than you started. And we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're just not doing it. Okay. So how does how you work in fashion? How does fashion um, how does fashion help that process? How does fashion 
which you, whether it is the second greatest polluter or the third or whatever, it, 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 we know that it is, it is a culprit. Yeah. And, I mean, and how do you, how do you, with your, your platforms, I, I know you talked, I, when I talked to Stella McCartney, it's the same situation that when you look out at your world, do you see, um, do you see change coming? Do you see people, do you see people moving quickly enough? No, the answer is I don't see it quickly enough. I see a, a progress of speed from the last past years. But to answer your first question, because it's like basically what I ask myself every day, because the better thing I can do is just stay, stay home, right? But at the same time, I feel that, that I want to be of service for this movement. And so I want to be able to, and I don't say I, we, we, you know, at Chloe, we at Gabriela Hurst want to try and figure out a new system that we can do business in this new economy, right? Because people do need jobs and they knew, they knew a new way of thinking. And I don't care who comes with the solution, to be honest, from our, I, it's just like, I think that we all have to be trying. And when somebody says, and we're open source at Chloe, so anything we do, it's, it's to be shared. Um, and we're measuring good progress. Um, is it fast enough? Is it is it exactly what what um, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, and I'm definitely not fast enough for my standards. But we, everybody's like, Gabby, we're moving really fast. <laughs> like, but I I think that we can't talk anymore. We have to do action, right? But you know it's interesting because your your clothing is the is the medium and the medium is the message. Do you feel that? Uh, do you feel that your clothes because your clothes embody your principles? Mm -hmm. do, you feel, do you feel people get that? I mean, I was looking at the the last Chloe collection, for example, or your own collections. Always, when you look at individual items, the story in, in each item is a facet of your commitment, your passion, your desire for change. Does it connect with people, do you think? Or, or, or are they, this is, when they put something on and it's gorgeous and it's soft and it turns out to be cashmere that's been upcycled from mm -hmm. somewhere that otherwise would have been waste. Mm -hmm. you think it hits them like, my God, this is beautiful. This would have been thrown out if Gabriella Hurst hadn't got it and turned it into this thing I'm wearing right now. I, I think people connect uh, to it for sure. I think that at the beginning people were buying more because it w people related to our to to what I was doing at Gabriela Hurst because they thought it was beautiful and it was speaking to them. And by the way, I just want to make something clear about Gabriela Hurst. We we do control growth. It Gabriela Hurst. It's purposely kept a com a company that goes small piece by piece by piece because we're only going to be seven years old right so it's a different experience when you go to a, a company that's 70 years old and you're a link in the chain right so i do think that now people want to know more and this demand of transparency is key and i think that's the duty for our client to be demanding better right and i don't think you can fool customers i don't think that just let me let me write the logo right like i just feel like we have to do more uh for our product and i've always thought about our our client of is we put clothes on our largest organ which is the skin right we take care of what we're eating we need to be taking care of what we're putting in our skin so I think we're just starting to 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 really have that demand, and this is why we had Eon, the the digital. Um, at, uh, uh, we launched it in in COVID, where it's basically transability, because people are starting to demand why where are you making your things, why are you making them like this. You better have your answers checked, right? Like you better know why you're doing what, and you better be like ready to look at me. You know, in a funny way, working with, uh, actually not in a funny way, in a very serious way, working at the luxury end of the fashion 
the fashion market. When when I just read something about uh, a statistic that came out came out of COP today that the the top 0.0001 percent in the world, you know, the people who buy luxury goods, uh, are responsible for uh, each one of them is responsible for 70 times more carbon emissions than the people at the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. So in a way, they are the people who are most desperately in need of 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 illumination about their habits and their and and being made to be accountable for the way that they live. Yeah. Um, do you think that fashion is brave enough to confront those people? I I think that creatives have. You know, fashion is an industry. So I, I just can tell you about what I thought from the beginning when we launched Gorilla Hearst, which was, and I, I had a profile done by uh, WWD, the 10 of tomorrow, and they asked me what, and I said, buy one sweater, just don't buy a lot. It was just like a simple concept of just buy one thing you like of quality that you want the thing for the rest of your life. So I think the messaging of new trend, that, that, that needs to stop, that rhythm needs to stop. I think we have to kind of put the endocrinous systems down a bit, right? To really talk about quality and long-term. And, and I think fashion, as much as a lot of other industries, they're t- tied to the short-term view that I think it's one of the reasons we, we may be facing this mice because we're always looking at the short term, short term, short term, mm-hmm. instead of a long term plan of how we get there. So that comes back to consumption. And, and it's interesting. I was talking to um, to uh, Mutual Prada a few weeks ago about about this issue and, and about you, you talked about how your own business is very, very controlled. The growth is very controlled. If you were looking at smaller businesses, which would be maybe less um, toxic, which would inevitably mean higher costs, Mm -hmm. that is something that we have to reconcile ourselves to? I think your impact as a small business is always going to be lower by definition because you're doing less right and if you're doing it more repurposed i mean all the young designers that i see all the up-and-coming designers um uh, they are they have this really you know the environment is like it's very present it's really i have not met a, a young designer or that it's not uh that doesn't feel responsible for for doing a luxury brand in a in a in a sustained way or or is trying, mm-hmm. but I do think that because they're smaller and I had these conversations before even launching Gabriela Hurst with uh, Julie Gilhart, where I spoke to her about the materials I was trying to use and she was telling me okay everything you're using already is going to be lower impact by definition and as a practice right with every like everything you start you start with a small ambition and then that becomes bigger and then you go with every practice you start becoming better and so immediately I understood uh, pretty early on what materials to use that have a lower impact to the environment and then I went into packaging and understanding where we are at packaging and then you know trying to upscale those concepts to 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 what we're trying to do at Chloe Um, I think if you're in a medium to larger brand you have a very big responsibility for accountability because we don't have a system today. Like when you buy an apple in a supermarket, that's organic and that's not organic. We don't have that. But this is why Chloe did the B Corp certification that that it's an accountability process. It forces you to look at yourself in the mirror um, and, and validate what you're saying and validate what you're doing. Because again, no one in the industry is doing it perfect. And, but we have to bring solutions because we have the ability to do it. And there has to be a moment of reckoning, which is like, you know what? The music is going to stop for a while. We all be going to be okay, right? Just how we went through COVID, right? And understand that we cannot be delaying that, that check forward. This is... I was so grateful that my business was small when COVID hit. You have, you know, yeah. I was stressed, but I was grateful. 
that my 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 business was small because I knew we were going to be okay. But but don't you think it's a really interesting challenge for fashion that the goal would be something other than growth? Yeah. Because you know the billion dollar company is always oh, yeah. I, I, I I agree. Really, yeah, I'm not into that. So I'm you, like, still, you still read that where people are talking about this company is going to be a billion dollars, blah blah blah. But but if the goal is other than growth. Well, you just, just call it, why don't the trillion dollar grant? I mean, yeah, it's yeah. for me so ridiculous. I, I've never been in that concept. I, I just don't. I think that certain things need time to grow. If you do this, like this very fast, and this is from a farm, you do this very fast, you're going to do it like this very fast. So it's mm -hmm. very steady. For me, steady, steady goes. What is that saying in English? Slow wins the race. What is oh, that? Thing? Slow and steady wins the race. Slow, slow and steady wins the race. Well, it's the tortoise and the hare, isn't it? It's the old, yeah. well, one of the oldest fables. Turtle. Um, <laughs> are you ever daunted by what you what you're faced by? I mean, you and you when, when I, every time I talk to you, and you're nothing other than completely driven and positive and and articulate about what you want to achieve. But do you ever have moments where you just think, you know, like when your kids say, I don't want to have kids. I mean, that must be very, that must be quite daunting for a mother. I'm, I'm, I'm terrified of climate crisis. This is why I mobilize. I am absolutely terrified, but I am wired. And I don't know, because again, growing up in the ranch and, you know, coming across dangerous situations when a, your horse take off and it's like you have to do moves to live or survive in that moment or just like, you know, take quick decisions. For whatever reason I'm wired, the way I'm right, wired, genetic, I mean, that's my mom. Um, whatever it is, I'm the type of person that fear makes me mobilize. It doesn't, um, it's like a survival instinct. Fear doesn't uh, get me still. I can't be, I don't, fear doesn't paralyze me. It takes me to action, good or bad. That's the way I react. So this is, I, and also I don't like to be frustrated. So instead of, you know, I, I, I one time read uh, something that was having happening in Yemen that just crushed me, right? A kid that was, was uh, refugees that were in the North of Yemen and, and it was just heart wrenching and I started crying and I'm like, what is my, who are my tears helping? It's not helping anyone. It's not helping the family there, right? So then we did a we did a, a Yemen Christmas two week Christmas uh, project with Save the Children that I I sit with them in the board. So I don't I I I try since I'm a kid I have this list of things that I do. I call it my wish list, but um, it's basically anything that gives me anxiety or or scaring me. I write the opposite result, right? What I want. And at the beginning, I used to be, you know, my friends used to make fun of it. They don't make so much fun anymore about it. But I find it really interesting way of programming yourself, um, of programming your brain, of giving this computer a drive to work, to function. And so that's what I do. I just write what I want professionally, what I want for others, what I want for my family, what I want for the world. I just write it down. You know, I saw your notebooks after the show and I've never seen anything like that. It was almost like if you drew it, it would town. Yeah. It's like crazy town. I hope that one day somebody publishes those because... I have, I have them all here. They're ready. They're like it, there. I mean, oh it felt God. to me like um, magic realism, like real Latin American magic oh, realism. Yeah. That, that when you put it in your book, it happens. And you just said that that's the case. When you write, you know, when you write what you want to happen, it happens. Well, but listen, it, it can be magic realism or it can be science, right? I, I hasn't, it's like you, my arm is moving right now. My brain is telling my arm to move. I just don't know how it's moving. I'm not conscious of how it's moving, but maybe if I program myself to something that I want to achieve, maybe I'll move towards that. And now I even take it to the next level where where with my friends and my kids, we say, what's the daily purpose? What do you want to achieve today? What do you want to feel today? It can be just like joy or happiness. It's just something simple. But program yourself towards that. You have access to your well-being in an instant, right? To an instant. And, and it's, it's just there. I mean, but you're also confronted by uh, the horrors of, the horrors or the dissatisfactions of reality the whole time. 
I mean, what, what is your greatest satisfaction, do you think? Oh, now, my... What gives you, what makes you happiest now? Oh, you my... always seem really happy. So what makes you happy, happiest? Well, at first, I, I want to say one thing. I do believe that if you're not in a position of survival, meaning if you don't have to make sure that your kid has something to eat tonight, if you have a safe shelter, if you're, there's health, if everything is fine, right? If you're not in intrinsic danger, you or your close ones, you have a duty to, to help. And the more you have, the more you have to help. So that's the duty that I'm driven by, right? That like, I'm, I, if, if somebody can go do something, I feel that I'm healthy. I feel I'm driven. I feel I have the ability to go and put myself and putting myself, not putting myself out there. It's really uh, not honorable for me. And then what makes me happy is it's, it's my kids. I'm like, they're my muses. And my girls are like 13 years old. They're funny as hell. My six-year-old is like, they, you know, my six-year-old wants to be a helper. My, my, my twins want to want to be a human rights lawyer and never met a five-year-old who should want to be a lawyer since she's five. The one wants to be a lawyer and the other one wants to be a journalist. And they keep me so intrigued and entertained and, and they know that they have responsibilities in this world and they take it, you know, with, with pride. And I, that makes me feel very good. Do you feel like a mama bear in a way? Yeah, I feel like I'm a mama bear of a lot of people, of my kids, of my friends. Um, I, I love my friends or there's, you know, my, my best friend, Stephanie, she's never asked me to kill anyone, <laughs> which <laughs> is thank God, because I would do anything for her. And so, so I am very loyal to, to my friends and my family and my husband and my people. And so I, I feel very, very loved. And that gives me a lot of, of uh, satisfaction. I can imagine that, 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 that growing up on a ranch you're very used to nature you know red and tooth and claw you're very you're very used to the realities of the world and i and i that that i feel that that sort of steeled you that you, you're steeled to things i mean my like you know not, not like normal is to see your mom being thrown for a for a horse i remember my brother like one day i turn around and he was just covered all in blood and he was like five Right. And we are like two hours away from the closest city. So he had fallen and opened his head on this on the on an edge. So my, I saw my mom. We were all in the in the pickup truck. Someone's driving. She's cutting my my brother's hair and we're all taking turns of putting the skin together. So he wouldn't have enough stitches. So you have your bloody brother. So you just have to. And my mom is not like crying or in a panic. She's like on it. Do you know what I mean? Then you can have your meltdown but first on it. So I think that's kind of. Now I know where the patchwork comes from. <laughs> the what? Now I know where the patchwork comes yeah, from. Yeah, and the blanket stitch. <laughs> do, you have a t do you have an internal timetable? What do you mean by that? Do you, do you, do you have like a five-year plan or, or what, yeah. what, are you, what are you imagining happens next? You have your own brand and now you have Chloe as well. So yeah. what do you see happening now? Honestly, all my desire right now is into climate success. Maybe you would ask me these, these things five years ago. I, I had it like to design a Chloe. It was a dream, which I'm doing, right? And uh, a lot of the things that, that I wanted to, to, to achieve are getting. And right now it's like, okay, it's, it's really stops being about me in a way. It has to be about something greater. I'm kind of a little sick and tired of me in a way. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like I want to be of service for 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 the for the dire times that we're living. And I and I know a bit too much on this, maybe or not enough. But the, that's all, all in perspective. But I can I can feel the suffering of others very close, and and I don't want to detach myself from it because the alternative is like what I take a matcha latte and I go and see something on Netflix. That that's okay. But I want to I want to be alive and connected to that to that uh, part of our collective consciousness. Gabriella, thank you so much. And thank let's you. do this again in a year or so and find out what happens. Yes, what happens next. Let's, let's do it. Let's I really do want it. to know what happens next. Me too. Thank you. Mwah.